Hello, everybody. Welcome to the great debate on slow science versus fast science. It is a real pleasure to hold this long awaited appointment, which we hope is of interest to a large portion of the scientific community. And while our original plan was to involve the audience in smaller group discussions, we have opted for a classic panel discussion, hoping to run more interactive versions of this event in the years to come, possibly in person, in case it's uh, successful. And the motivation of this debate stems from the experience of many early career scientists. Many of us struggle to find our path in the current academic system and the current implicit fast science paradigm is pushing us to quickly write papers, proposals, job applications at a pace that often clashes with other needs. For example, the need to follow the pace of a scientific procedure to better reflect on the significance of our data or the need to keep up with the newest literature. Or again, more practically, the need to settle in a new city or country every few years and to care for our personal life and that of other people, perhaps. So these issues may also affect senior researchers. However, undeniably, it is at the level of early careers competition that they cause a harsh selection on all of us. Here, therefore, a question spontaneously comes to mind. What kind of scientist should the system reward? Perhaps scientists with the highest age index or the most brilliant minds, those who are best at communicating or a healthy compromise of all these qualities or should we rethink the parameters that uh, we are basing our decisions on? The Slow Science Manifesto defines a movement that was born in response to the current publish or perish fast science paradigm. Slow scientists stand for a somewhat old fashioned idea of the academic system, if you may, where scientific curiosity is the important driver of research. Slow scientists protest against deadlines and constant publicity on social media. And slow scientists also long for more room to move backwards and sideways while the long term path of research advances slowly and incrementally. Now, the radical and visionary ideas of this manifesto are yet to be widely discussed and put into practice. Nevertheless, a confirmation that a substantial portion of the community perceives the current system as problematic is that a few of the slow science ideas can already be, uh, be found in recent examples. I'm gonna mention a few. Um, in the UK, several institutions have started evaluating the impact of researchers beyond the mere journal matrix and they are re rethinking the way impact is, is perceived and also calculated. A number of funding agencies have abandoned impact factors as a metric to evaluate applicants. For example, the DFG in Germany, the SNF in Switzerland, and I'm sure many others that I don't know of. Some job advertisements ask directly candidates to send their best publications together with the, with the rest of the documents, which suggests that search committees started reading papers rather than only the, the numbers of the impact factor and age indices. And I came across this yesterday, actually. Um, the, the former head of the ERC, Helga Novotny, said we need to have the number of scientific publications over the next 10 years in order to increase the quality accordingly. This is a quotation. The peer review system is on the verge of collapse worldwide because it can no longer adequately process the abundance of publications. So all these things, all these examples that I made, and I'm sure there are more, um, are giving a, a good picture of what is the situation, uh, perhaps not according to everyone, but uh, a portion of the community is agreeing that there is a problem. And do these examples, these, these citations, this uh, this application of the scientific, of the slow science um, manifesto, are this the way to go? Or how far should we go, keep on changing and revolutionizing the scientific system? To address this topic, we gathered four speakers today on our panel, and we decided to cover different backgrounds and career stages. We have uh, Professor Whitney Baer, who has been chair of structural geology and tectonic group in the Geological Institute of the ETH Zurich since summer 2018. Uh, Whitney completed her bachelor's degree at California State University Northridge in 26. 
and her PhD at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles in 2011. She then spent 11 months at Brown University as a postdoctoral fellow in the geophysics research group prior to arriving at ETH from 2012 to 2018. Whitney was an assistant professor in the Department of Geological Sciences at the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Whitney's research incorporates a variety of field, analytical and experimental techniques, all aimed toward understanding the formation in both active and ancient plate margins. Then we have Valeria Cigala, Dr. Valeria Cigala, comes from Italy. Um, her PhD, she got it at LMU Munich in Germany in 2017. For one year, she's been back at LMU Munich as a postdoc and she's non-tenured. Valeria is single and has been the ECS representative of the Natural Hazards Division for the past couple of years. Next, we have Stuart Lane, Professor Stuart Lane, who held tenure positions uh, variously at the Universities of Cambridge, Leeds and Durham in the UK since completing a PhD in 1994. Since 2001, has been at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland, and he is deeply concerned that academic has lost its way in embracing a system grounded in neoliberal thinking that undermines the very essence of what it is to be truly scientific. Allowing the world to speak back, to challenge how we are studying it, is the essence of being scientific, he says. This takes time, however, pressing the questions are, the are that motivate what we do. Lastly, but not least, we have Professor Dörte Tetzlaff, who received her PhD in Germany in 2004, then moved to Scotland on a postdoc fellowship. She became tenured there, first a lectureship, reader, and then a full professorship at the University of Aberdeen. She moved back to Germany in 2017, on joint position as a full professor and head of the department in a research institute. She's also editor-in-chief for hydrological processes, one of the very few female editors-in-chief in the water resource area. She's married with one nine-year-old child. So now um, that I introduce the background of our speakers, um, we have asked them to prepare a two minutes pitch each where they define the stance with respect to the slow science manifesto. So I welcome Professor Whitney Bear. Okay, thank you, Andrea, um, for that introduction. And also thanks for organizing this session. I think this is a great topic for us to discuss openly. Um, so in terms of my view on the slow science manifesto, I'll start with a point of agreement, which I think is a major one related to taking the time to think and to absorb um, and not rushing to publish as soon as we have a result. Um, I agree strongly that we, we need time to develop our, our ideas. Um, we need to cultivate them into impactful contributions. We need to obtain feedback through open discussions and we need to have time to explore further the implications of our work for concepts, processes, uh, localities that might be beyond the immediate focus of our research topic. Um, doing this properly takes time and resources and therefore it should naturally limit the number of publications that we can physically put out uh, per year if all of our papers are uh, adhering to the same uh, high quality standard, particularly if you're in a field-based or, or experimental uh, disciplines. So I think I'm overall pretty supportive of the aspects of the Slow Science Manifesto that encourage diligence in collecting, interpreting, and publishing results. I guess one point of disagreement was that the Slow Science Manifesto as it's written seems to undermine or at least downplay the importance of various forms of science communication, especially via social media. Um, personally, I think there's a lot of value to these informal science communication venues, Twitter, for example, for the primary reason that they attempt to connect the science itself to the scientists that conduct it. Uh, in other words, it emphasizes the more human aspects of scientific pursuit. It goes a long way to extracting the scientists from their ivory tower and requesting that they engage at a level that non-scientists or scientists from other disciplines um, can understand. And I think the requirement or encouragement for many journals recently to include a plain language summary along with a technical abstract is also along similar lines um, 
but was something that I got the impression the Slow Science Manifesto kind of devalues. I also really think these informal, more public facing, less technical mechanisms of outreach have a greater chance of reaching people uh, who are not already in the science sphere, didn't grow up in a science um, sort of background, and therefore it has the potential to help diversify our science. So I guess I disagree with the manifesto on some of the statements regarding how we might engage with the public and with the general concept that it advocates we should preserve an ivory tower like existence where we kind of sit around and think and separate ourselves from the public, um, which are the people who support us financially. Thank you very much. So next up is Valeria Chigala. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, Whitney, very, very uh, nice uh, insights. And I mostly agree with uh, what Whitney has just said. And I'll start by saying, um, I, I generally dislike the publish and perish motto. It, it's something that it makes me really think, it gives me the feeling that science and knowledge is something that we can trade at the stock market. And I really think it is value uh, everything that we do more than just research. But at the same time, so I, I read the manifesto and uh, of this low science, uh, which uh, um, I agree, it, it strives to give us the, the, the research uh, back to what is meaningful, like to do research in a, in a meaningful way uh, without caring uh, about all the indexes, basically. But at the same time, I'd like when the motto says, so we, we are scientists, we don't blog, we don't Twitter, uh, we, we take our time. And I was like, well, um, I work as a scientist, but I do blog, I do tweet, and I do like this side of the job. And I think it's important. Um, but still, I, I try to take my time. And indeed, I, I do realize that I don't have it. I, I, I don't have enough sometimes to do, to do everything. Um, and so I'm asking, so when, when um, possibly I'm the least uh, or like the, the earliest career uh, scientist uh, to, on today's panel, and um, I know that I'm asked uh, to do more uh, than research when I'm evaluated, but at the same time I find, so I, I've been experienced in both, both sides. Both sides. So I've been uh, evaluated very positively despite maybe my short list of publication. Uh, this is, for example, from, from DFK. I'm, I'm always able to get my own proposal basically right after my PhD uh, funded. But I've seen also, uh, I, like, uh, let's say, I've not been given an extension of contract at times because I don't publish enough. So, and, uh, and therefore, um, I'm, I have a lot of questions today and like, so do we, do we somehow have to have a more standardized evaluation process that somehow cut off the subjectivity or who is evaluating us and what personally they are expecting from us? So should we maybe redefine more clearly what the job task of a scientist are? And if, if, there, is, if there are tasks that fall off uh, the job, uh, the, the, or yeah, the more uh, def like clear definition, should we then have different opening of like different job position that cover those, those tasks for and help us covering this, those tasks. So this is what I will start from. Thank you. Thank you very much. So next up is Professor Stuart Lane. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for um, the invitation to speak and um, uh, uh, in particular to the two people who've gone before me that, that always help you uh, frame your own, uh, own comments. Um, I'm gonna make uh, three points and I guess then an observation. Um, and I signed up to the uh, slow science movement a long time ago uh, uh, and I don't tweet and I don't blog. And I perhaps can talk about why I don't think that's necessarily the primary role of a scientist in a democratic system, uh, perhaps a little bit later. Um, I actually agree very strongly with much of what the, the slow science movement argues for because of a deep problem concerning the sustainability of what we do. What we do is not sustainable. In my field, when I started my PhD in 1991, there were a few hundred papers published per year. That's grown exponentially since then to tens of thousands. We're producing an awful lot of work and who are we producing it for? Uh, it's not sustainable and it leads to a particular sort of 
uh, value system that focuses on counting rather than not only the quality, which I think is, is where we have to go of what we do, but perhaps more directly, uh, it goes in the direction of undervaluing a series of other things that are important to being the life of an academic. And those are things like the emotional support we give to colleagues and to students in helping them to gain the kind of training that they need, the experience that they need in the work that they kind of do. And this undervaluing of the other dimensions of being a good colleague um, worry me uh, enormously. But I don't think it's just about the, 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 the life of an academic. Um, and some of you uh, may have heard of the um, philosopher um, Isabel Stengers. And Isabel Stengers makes a, a lovely quote back in 2005. How can we present a proposal intended not to say what is or what to be, but to provoke thought, a proposal that requires no other verification than the way in which it is able to slow down reasoning and create an opportunity to arouse a slightly different awareness of the problems and situations mobling us. And for me, Isabel Stengers captures there the essence of being a scientist. It's being able to in my case as a geoscientist to be in the landscape and say hang on a minute that doesn't make sense i'm going the wrong way i need to change direction i need to look at it in a different way it's then that we make scientific progress it's not uh, scientific achievements are not what we publish uh, scientific achievements are are not how much we publish they are those moments when we suddenly discover that our knowledge needs to change and the history of science is replete with examples of where that's the case of course, it, to be talking about slow science at the end of a, of a, of a year when science has gone incredibly quickly um, in terms of dealing with a, a, a global, or helping to deal with the global pandemic, and I'm thinking here of a vaccination, it may seem very odd to be talking about uh, uh, slow science. I mean, don't we need scientists to go really quickly to solve the kinds of problems that we're facing as a society? But COVID itself is a fundamental example of slow science because the basis of the vaccines that are now starting to help us get back towards some sort of normal life weren't developed in a year. They were developed over 20, 30, 40 years back into the 1980s. And that's what we mean by the kind of science that I think we should be doing, that science that ultimately gives the foundations for a fair and democratic society. My observation, and it is the challenge with slow science is the system. And of course, it's very easy for me as an established scientist to take risks, but how do you think about working in a system that still, despite the work of many research councils and university appointments panels, still focuses on quantifi quantification of the, and those kinds of easily measured outputs that are apparently objective when you actually look into them are just as subjective uh, as other kinds of things. So I'm a strong supporter of the slow science movement, although I do worry that it's gonna take some time before it actually uh, becomes something that's um, fairly and fully um, applied in the academy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. So next up is Professor Dörte Tetzlaff. Yeah, um, thank you also to the uh, for me for to the conveners for organizing this interesting uh, session and looking at the number of participants. You really kind of put the finger fingers on the pulse. Um, uh, it's it's a very hot topic, um, and I thank the previous speakers because they summarized a lot um, of my thoughts, which I won't repeat. Um, Maybe just to adding a bit, um, so I also completely agree with the idea behind the slow uh, science manifesto, because I, I do think science thinking needs simply time and also like uh, Stuart uh, explained quite nicely this opportunity to adapt uh, and, and maybe change and be flexible in terms of our scientific approaches. And what I often notice is um, I, would, I would be a stronger support of incremental development. And I, I observe in the past few years, um, this development that somehow incremental science is viewed as pure, a poor science, uh, whether this is in grant proposal panels, a publication, it's often viewed as, or that's just incremental science. And in my view, slow science is somehow should be at least in parts incremental science because we are building 
up on previous knowledge and taking again our time uh, to, to move forward. But what I also uh, sometimes observe is that slow science is used as an excuse for perfectionism. And in my view, and again, I've worked with many colleagues, I've supervised a lot of colleagues, uh, uh, postdocs, PhDs, uh, who use the excuse as uh, it's not perfect yet to not doing anything. And I think perf perf perfectionism can really limit scientific progress. So I think it's kind of, it's finding the balance between thinking time and not fall into the perfectionism trap if I can uh, put it this way. So science needs reflection. Um, also in my view, I do think writing a paper and publishing is often the only way to reflect. Again, I've seen this uh, a lot in my, in my own group that just in the process of completing a paper, that's the, that's the time where, um, where we reflect and where we have to interpret our own findings and make them understandable to the wider community and audience. And I think paper writing does exactly this, this step. But of course, at the rate, as we see it at the moment, it's again, as Stuart said, completely unsustainable. Um, uh, just the amount of, of, of papers. Again, uh, when I talk about our, my journal, hydrological processes, we get more than 1,000 papers submitted per year. And that's a relatively small journal. So it's, it is not sustainable. I started, I was also uh, someone who for a long time tried to protect myself from any social media exchange simply because I've reached uh, my bandwidth. Uh, I couldn't take any more interaction in. I'm, I'm on Twitter now since 2020, so about a year. Um, it's kind of, it's just tenable that I maybe check every few days, but it is, a, again, it's a fine line of just making one busy, that's my view, and distracting maybe from this so important reflection time and thinking time. And just a final note, maybe on this, what qualities should the system reward? Um, why do we need rewards? I, again, in my view, I always felt that if someone reads my papers, that's an important reward. So I somehow have written something important, maybe something relevant for some other scientists and maybe in a way which other people can read. Um, I think somehow we do need metrics of assessment, whether they are viewed as objective or subjective, simply for pragmatic reasons. Um, whether we are in, on appointment panels, whether we are on promotion panels. Um, but I completely agree, anyone on any such decision forum or panel should consider a rounded CV. So by rounded CV, and I think Stuart again mentioned this, it should be a combination that a scientist has shown um, the person can write, publications, not, not many, but good quality papers. So this means this person can complete science and investigations, but aspects of mentoring and scientific service are as important. So I do think it's trying to find these rounded CVs, um, which, which should be maybe used as matrix for assessment, if I can call it this way. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I hope the audience could grasp all the spectrum of opinions that we have today on board. Um, we, the way we thought this debate to proceed now is uh, that we select the three major topics around which we'd like the debate to revolve. Uh, and then we, we move also according to what pops up in the Q&A. In fact, uh, we have two questions by uh, Pierre-Henri Blatt, um, who touched one of our points uh, that were was thought to be number two, but we move it to position number one now. And that is the trade-off between quantity and quality of output. So short funding periods and the importance of publication metrics keep a competitive environment, uh, but they reward speed over quality. So how much slower is the sweet spot? Would scientists perform better without the urge to publish? So that, that's kind of the main topic right now. And um, the question from the Q&A directly um, is, um, 
stating that the ratio papers out over time available is the key limiting variable to ensure proper peer review and the required quality control. I think that preprint open platforms are not improving the problems caused by the publish or perish motto. On the contrary, I would rather prefer a global limitation of the number of papers per authors, perhaps, that can be submitted every year. These already exist in conferences and uh, one paper per article per conference for time limitations. In life, we also have time limitations. So publication quota decided at a global level per discipline could be a valuable and fair instrument. What do our speakers think about this? Um, should we keep the same order as before, perhaps? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Um, I think adding sort of another metric that then uh, prevents people from publishing a certain amount per year is not really the way to go. I mean, I think different fields do science and publish different increments in different ways. Um, you know, field science, for example, takes longer and you know, we may expect fewer papers than from people who are in a very fast moving biomedical type of field. Um, so I don't know if, if a hard number is that way. I will say that I think there's already kind of a self selection or a recognition among scientists that if you look at someone's Google Scholar profile and you see their publishing, you know, 10 to 37 or, you know, just, just, you know, numbers above 10 or even five sometimes in certain fields, then you do start to question what they're uh, how they could possibly be doing real science, I guess, is, is my own feeling. And so there's some self-collection, self-selection among researchers to recognize that, you know, if someone's publishing this much, then I don't see how it's possible to have a time for it to be uh, the quality that we should expect. Um, that said, I think there's a disconnect between what individual researchers see or view this kind of publication metric and universities do. And I think there's a perverse incentive for many universities, financial incentive given to researchers both directly or explicitly and implicitly um, to raise their publication numbers. And that this is something that we as faculty need to really be fighting against and be educating our universities and revising the way that universities are ranked such that this number of publications is never a factor. So that's my own sense about it. Thank you. Valeria? Yeah, um, well, I, I find it as well a very kind of hard question. I, I, I don't know, I wouldn't also go for a new, a new number or a new index. Um, I would still hope that uh, it's more something, again, that, that the committees are like, should be able to actually read our papers through. Um, and and evaluate on the quality more than again on the quantity and and I, I wouldn't limit uh, yeah people I mean if if maybe a scientist is very productive one year and then but then it's been not productive maybe for a couple of years before because it was doing like the investigation it was doing the research and and then in in one year he's able maybe to yeah to produce maybe two three papers that's great and. Um, I wouldn't limit then is is out of the data outcomes. Sorry, uh, and but I also find an interesting sort of part of the preprint. I have kind of, I'm like to uh, to hear what what the what the other speakers also have to say with, uh, about preprint services. Um, I'm still a little bit. Um, I mean, I'm unsure of the the pro and the con of of these services. Um, I've seen, I know that it, it changes a lot depending on the field, the discipline, scientific discipline. Um, I've seen how much preprints have been used over the past year for the, during the pandemic uh, by journalists not really knowing what, what a preprint is and, and use it as, as published uh, peer review research um, to, to give answers or to pretend to give answers to, to, uh, to people. And, um, and I'm like, is it really, I don't know. Is it really working this way? Is it, um, it uh, without? Is it valuable also in the debate on 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 publishing more or less or being fast or, or slow in, in science? I, I don't know. Thank you, Stuart. Yes, I mean, I'll follow Valeria's comments with a with a with a, a few comments on um, preprints. I mean, I'm afraid I'm deeply skeptical about the notion of preprints. Um, one of the problems we've got uh, is we've forgotten what academic publication is about. I mean, academic publication 
is about producing uh, a, a work uh, that stands the test of time. It's almost impossible to unpublish a journal article. And I often give the example of my father-in-law who uh, wrote a paper in the early 1970s that is still being cited. And it was, I, he's not in an academic now. And I, I was able to show him this once that his paper was still being read and cited. Now it stands the test of time because it's been through a peer review process. So one of the things we have to ask ourselves is, is the peer review process working? And is the peer review process producing fair uh, outcomes? If it is, then we have a clear distinction between publication um, of a journal article in a peer review system uh, and what is in a preprint server. Now, if you take the volume of material that's been published in, the, in, 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 in journals at the moment, we don't have enough time to read that, let alone to be reading material that may well be misleading because it hasn't been through uh, an effective uh, peer review system. So much as though it's frustrating because it take, a good peer review system takes time uh, and requires the effort of a large number of people and all the questions over open access and uh, publishers and profit and so on come into that. If we put all of that to one side, we still are left with the, the, the principle that the um, uh, that there is something about the journal article and its role and its status that I worry we are losing in this rush to make our findings available ever more quickly. Thank you. Dörte? Yeah, uh, I mean, I com again completely agree what Stuart said on the uh, preprints. We have to keep in, in mind that peer review has its place and, uh, and, and, and some kind of importance. But I, I still wanted to get back what um, uh, Whitney said at the beginning. Um, I mean, I myself would describe myself as a person who publishes quite a lot per, per, per year. So probably it is easily 10 papers per year. Of course, I'm not uh, the first author on all of these papers. It's kind of, it's my group. And I feel again a responsibility that my PhDs and postdocs, they get their papers out. But at the same time, I take pride. I read all of these papers at least three times and edit them heavily. So what it is, and I know we scientists often don't want to hear it, writing papers is just extremely hard work. And it's a lot of work. And um, I think that there is just, we just have to accept this. And I've seen some questions in terms of, um, this is maybe related, but some uh, uh, participant asked whether we feel that um, social media activity um, is kind of, it, it, or that slow science means we shouldn't do social media. I think, and I can only speak about myself. The reason for limited social media it's not that I doubt the value of it in terms of spreading the science. It is simply a time capacity. And there, that's maybe again a personal choice. I would say then I would prefer the limited time which is available to me as a mother as well, uh, which I want to prioritize. Then I have to edit papers of my group members rather than posting any step in my thinking on social media. I think that's that's the thing, that I sometimes get the impression any in-between step is already is shared on social media. And we have to remember every post takes a few seconds, and these few seconds are just taken away from a 24-hour day. So I think that's more my point of view, that it's not social media is versus slow science it's just a personal capacity question what's doable in 24 hours day okay thank you very much um, we've seen that uh, social media is popping up more often than not in our replies so perhaps we could uh, dive deeper into this topic um, if my co-communers can help me a second here, are there any questions in the Q&A that could address Yeah, hi. One? Hi, Andrea. So there was one main question, I think, that wasn't clear to people uh, why science communication would be actually slow science. So how is that connected with each other? I think, Whitney, that would be, um, would be good for you maybe to answer or to say something yeah, about I, that. Yeah, I have that. 
I have that difficulty making that connection as well. I don't, I don't see them as at odds with each other, that you can still take your time on your science, but still be a really good science communicator. And I agree with uh, Dirkta, but I also feel that, you know, we talked about the benefit of being a well-rounded scientist with, with a profile that spans more than just publications. And so I consider science communication part of that well-roundedness and, 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 and not just communication at conferences to our colleagues, our direct colleagues, but to our, our parents, our, our friends, our grandparents, you know, um, people in the public, the people that give us money to actually do science. I just think it's really fundamental that we build into our profile as scientists, this communication aspect. And social media is just one of many venues, but I think it's proven itself to be an extremely effective one that especially young people recognize and, and use like the back of their hands. Some of them can use phones and Twitter better than they can use you know, a, a computer or an Excel spreadsheet. So I just see it as, um, as a really fundamental aspect of our, or independent of the slow science versus fast, that's just part of our jobs. Thank you. Do Stuart, do you have uh, do you have a, a statement? Uh, yes, on, that? So, <laughs> <laughs> what I've already said, I, I you probably guess I have a certain skepticism of social media. My starting point is actually I think a certain liberty. I think we should be finding ways of practicing uh, our 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 our, our as a as scientists. We should we should and, and if social media is an important way of communicating if that kind of communication to us is important then we should we should strongly be doing it i mean i think that the the thing that has been eroded uh, certainly in the time i've been in the university system um is the notion of academic freedom and one of the great things i think society has um is people who are do have that freedom and take the responsibilities and the rights that come with that but but the freedom then I think to, to, to choose the way you wish to, to communicate is perhaps where the slow science um, uh, movement is a little bit too, too strong. I am deeply skeptical about um, social media for two reasons. I mean, one is Dirta has, has explained this very well, it takes time. And I have seen recently situations with young scientists effectively displacing other kinds of important activities like paper writing uh, with tweets and blogs and assuming that those are somehow interchangeable and I think we have to be very careful about that uh, that that message but secondly I think we have to also ask ourselves realistically if we each have um, a Twitter uh, site um, uh, how many uh, uh, of us are going to be able to follow all of the Twitter sites we want to follow in a reasonable amount of time and how many of us actually have people outside of the academic uh, academy uh, following our tweets? And I suspect we would be somewhat disappointed uh, were we to look uh, at the number of people um, in society at large uh, that actually follow uh, academics. I suspect that there are a few academics that are followed, uh, but for 99.9% for .9 of us, most of our work is of absolutely no interest to the general public. And that gets into a much deeper question about the democratization of scientific uh, processes and progress. And we are working in a very asymmetrical system. Certain people, um, whether they're elected officials, whether it's certain kinds of industries, have much more power to commission the science that we do, to fund what we do, uh, than others. And actually the large swathes of, of the population um, uh, out there have very little opportunity to influence uh, uh, what we what we do. And I therefore find myself in a very um, uncomfortable position if I start saying I must, uh, and note the word must there, I think it's fine to do it if you wish, but I, if, I, if I must start um, disseminating my, my material to these people, in effect, I'm imposing a particular worldview on them that they've had absolutely no say uh, in terms of shaping and developing. And so I think there are deep democratic questions here that we have to reflect upon when we start to talk about um, what society wants and our responsibilities to society. They are more complex than we perhaps imagine. Thank you very much for this thoughtful answer. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned uh, is that questions in the Q&A can be upvoted. So we, we'll get through as many questions as possible, but we have limited time today. Um, so if you think there is one particular topic addressed by questions that merits more attention than others, you are free to upvote them. So for example, the top one right now we could address 
um, by an anonymous attendee. I have always related the fast science culture with the bottleneck to access jobs in academia. There is many new thousands of PhD students and postdocs looking for jobs in academia every year versus very few positions available. Can we address the problematic fast science culture without treating the problem of the lack of jobs in academia? Should universities start funding much fewer PhD projects to reduce this problem? Is this likely to happen, considering that they function as for-profit businesses nowadays? How do we address the fast science culture problem Is this can, if this can be changed? Um, would like to answer this. Well, I mean, I raised my hands. I don't know if you, if you see this. I mean, I, I wouldn't call it so much a fast uh, uh, science, but I think the, the issue, and that's uh, at least European-wide, is uh, it's, it's a funding issue. It's that most funding bodies uh, fund uh, PhD uh, projects. They fund major um, uh, graduate schools. And I would say, again, compared to even just a few years ago, if, if someone wants to do a PhD today, they find a project very, very quickly. Um, and I, I think the concern is, and the big uh, issue is that then no funding is available for postdoc positions. And I think we are, for years now, and that applies to many European countries, I'm not so um, uh, aware about how it is in North America, for example, or other continents, is, is we are producing the really masses of uh, PhD students and no, no opportunity is provided what comes next. And I think that's, that's a, a major issue that the funding bodies actually tell us you can't ask for a postdoc position to apply, it's, it's too expensive. And I think so. I, I think that's not so much a fast, slow science question. That's really a major funding issue, and and probably we need again a paradigm shift here, in terms of that maybe not a, a necessary next step after doing your master does not have necessarily to be doing your PhD. Um, that's my view. Yeah, yeah, I agree completely with uh, Dirta on that. And I think um, there was this really nice article just came out yesterday, I think in EOS, um, where it was trying to revise the idea of a pipeline or a track in academia to something more analogous to sort of braided streams, you know, and kind of how there can be different tracks that people take. And sometimes a master's goes into industry for a while and goes to PhD. And I think we are stuck in this kind of classic academic track um, that then funnels people through the PhD to postdoc and says, well, your next natural step is obviously, you know, a faculty position and those jobs don't exist, but we still need the education level of a PhD to go into all sorts of other branches of our science. And I don't think we want to limit the number of PhDs we have, but we want to be more flexible and more informative about other career paths besides academia. Just my thoughts on it. Thank you. I uh, just a quick comment that um, I know there is some flexibility in, in certain funding agencies, for example, I myself I am currently employed as a postdoc on a, a funding that was originally thought to be for a PhD student. So at least you are not can... supposed to say this, Andrea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so um, it has come to our attention um, that we have a lot of um, questions talking about how could we survey the current state, how could we go ahead and solve things. Uh, Micha, do you have something to say about this? Yeah, sure. I could I could simply see that. I, so I screened the, the Q&A box and the, indeed there's a lot of, of discussion on, on the current state, right? What do we like? What do we not like? And, and I think it would be a good idea to kind of, of shift the scope slightly to move ahead what could be ways out of the, the problems that we've identified or the current issues that we've identified. And in the Q&A, there's uh, some suggestions like, like reducing the number of students would basically automatic or might automatically lead back to slow science, uh, the number of students, PhD students, postdocs. And another suggestion that was, was uh, brought up would be more fixed term contracts might uh, automatically lead to slowing down of the scientific process. If there would be any ideas from the, from the panel, um, I don't know who wishes to go ahead. 
So what would be ways out of the current of the current situation? Um, if I can say something that um, I I often have the feeling um, the, the the shortness of contracts is is really a problem, uh, especially I would say after the PhD. Um, I I'm, I mean I've been running on uh, two years uh, projects and for the past four years I had to stop after one year one postdoc because I got them funding for a two years project. But now, for example, I'm after one year of project in the pandemic, I haven't got much results. I'm supposed to write a new project because in one year I won't have funding again. And how do I do that? I mean, I would I would like to have more time to work on, on my project. I don't I don't really have it. And I really have to think about the new ideas and how to to uh, yeah to continue uh, working on that. So I would I would say that one one for me one solution would really be stop having at least the one year contracts. They, to me, they don't make sense uh, because you take at least six months to get into a project into a subject, and and then after six months you're supposed to have produced something and 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 go somewhere else. Uh, two years is the way in between, and maybe if there wasn't a pandemic, <laughs> that would be fine. Uh, but I would say that a, a three, working on a three to four years timeline for me would be a solution. I don't know how feasible that, because that, that is costly. I know it's expensive, but I, I totally see the point. We, we also, why you funding engines and funds more PhD candidates than, than postdoc? Because yeah, they are cheaper. But is it, I mean, does it really work then this way? Um, no, to me. Please. Yeah, Stuart has a raised hand. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think I think that there is a what, just to bridge across, bridge back for a moment to the, the last question. There is a fundamental problem. There are many more people doing PhDs who would like academic jobs than there will ever be academic jobs, and that is actually uh, in, in that kind of situation, things are not straightforward. And so, thinking about the broader structure of how funding is distributed across different levels of career, um, I think is very important. Um, you know, and I'm a, a, a great believer in the idea that we shouldn't be overfunding academics with too many PhD students. Those kinds of uh, uh, sim simple types of measures. I think there are things that that are at various degrees have had various degrees of um, uh, adoption in the academic world. That, that will help. I mean, one is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, which commits uh, us as evaluators to evaluating the quality and not the quantity of publications. And I've been involved in appointments panels uh, and also in the Swiss National Science Foundation recently, where we were actually talking about limiting the number of outputs um, that academics uh, applying for funding, whether it's projects, or whether it's careers funding, early career researchers, limiting the number of outputs that you have. So for somebody who's applying for a postdoc level um, research fellowship, for instance, we would just say, the only thing we want to know about are three outputs. We don't want a full output list because those sorts of things um, help people to focus on the quality and not the quantity. The same is true in appointments uh, procedures. I mean, one of the great difficulties on an appointments panel is when you've got somebody um, who's been in academia for 20 years, who's got this long, long CV up against somebody who's three or four years out of a postdoc. And again, get both of them to submit their, their three or four or five best papers. These are the kinds of things that can switch uh, emphasis onto the quality of what you're doing now uh, uh, and help, help to judge people. Another thing is moving to, and this touches this, this um, what, what Whitney said was the idea, I, I quite like the analogy she gave of braided river, um, as I work on braided rivers, but, but, but the, no, the notion of, an, of a net academic age helps in this sense. And again, the, the Swiss National Science Foundation has recently moved away completely from conventional eligibility requirements for, for um, research fellowship funding, and now uses what's called a net academic age, where it is the number of of, of months or years since you finished your PhD spent working in an academic research post that defines your academic age. So if you've had caring leave, um, if you've gone off and worked for three years in industry, those years are not counted in terms of uh, your net academic age, which is then used to judge the, the CVs, that, uh, CVs that we have. 
so there are things that can be done. I mean, the problem with these these things is that that and and I I can certainly share the Swiss National Science Foundation's experience is that you can sign up for these policies, and you can get these policies going. Getting academics to follow them is much much more challenging, and that actually I, I remain quite quite astonished sometimes that the extent to which this culture of counting has become embedded. In the academy in a very uncritical way and it's that that's got to change so however much you come up with initiatives and new policies and um, it's the it's the people like it like me who've actually got to change not actually necessarily the uh, uh the policies themselves yeah thank you very much for this because it leads very well into the most upvoted questions um sabrina metzger is asking can the panelists give examples of how to be a role model in this subject? That is, for, uh, for instance, what they tell their students. Who wants to start on that? Derte? Yeah, I mean, I assume it's on the subject as to the, um, the slow science versus fast science. So that's what I would answer now. I don't know if this is the subject of the question. The, the problem is, again, the students, of course, in most countries, they, they have to write now three papers for, uh, to be able to submit a PhD. I, th I think that's right, uh, rather than uh, focusing on PhD thesis, which are then rotting away and uh, getting dusted off in some library. So I think this focus, but that's, again, it's, it's three papers. And again, in most countries, this is just changing in Germany now that DFG funds more four year projects. Um, but usually it's three year funding and you have to write your three papers. So again, if you're honest, and like Whitney said earlier, you have to do at least a year, if not 18 months field work, usually at least in the field I'm working. That's, that's three extremely tough years. That's, I tell my students, okay, if you want to do a PhD, these three years will be the toughest, um, uh, even postdoc years are already easier because you kind of can spread usually um, what you are working on. Um, and, and there it's even particular important in these three years um, to focus and use your time very, very wisely and um, avoid any displacement activity as Stuart mentioned it earlier, um, because otherwise it's impossible to do field work to do um, uh, writing three papers and get through this uh, unheard through these three years. I'm trying to tell my students, remember, you don't have to win your Nobel Prize just yet after your PhD. You are just demonstrating that you can independently conduct research during your PhD. So keep a lot of the ideas uh, you can still follow up later in your life. So again, this links a bit back to this perfectionism, which I said earlier or mentioned earlier, because that's what I observe often uh, uh, with members in my team is this, but if I just work another two months on this, it will get so much better. And it's uh, the most important law is the 80-20 rule, um, is that when you have reached your 80% your input and hard work, if you spend another 20% and another year working, it, it, it gets maybe 20% better. So sometimes it's just important to say it's it's fine, it's good, uh, and, and complete things. I'm not advocating when I say it this way, low quality, again, just to emphasize this, but I try to, to steer my students in, in learning when to say stop, and that's just fine. So that's what I tell my students. Someone would like to go next and comment on this. Sure, I can. Um, I guess I must admit I, I struggle a lot with uh, communicating to students how exactly they should go about publishing their work. Um, and it's because I've become more and more cognizant of the fact that publications are used as an immediate tool or limit among search committees for weeding students or postdocs out. And sometimes it's the number, sometimes it's just having any or having all of your PhD topics published. And I've had students sort of break down in my office because another faculty member or committee member has told them that they should have X number of publications by the time they graduate if they wanna be taken seriously for an academic job. 
And so I feel often I, I have to, I feel the pressure to balance this even on their behalf against something that's more slow, slow science like um, that allows them to take their time and uh, cultivate their results and tweak them after feedback and go to conferences and present on them, et cetera. So I, I haven't found the, the right answer as a balance. I guess I, I, I don't require three publications by the time they finish, but three publishable units and, and, and various states of publication. I'll also note that I've been struck since moving to Europe that at how much shorter the PhDs are, typically three, maybe three and a half to four years, whereas in the US, um, it's more like five to six years, and yet the publication requirements are actually identical, Three, typically three chapters are um, at a minimum. And so I think that's an interesting cultural difference between Europe and the US, um, and so may impact you know, our publication standards, I'm not sure. So I don't have an answer, but that's my thoughts on it. <laughs> Yeah, Stuart. Yeah, I think that the, the, the notion of the PhD is 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 evolved and has actually become a little bit confused at, at the moment. I mean, uh, in Europe, the PhD is formally um, a training degree. It's not a research degree, um, and we've often forgotten that. Um, and so, therefore, my my view of PhD students is very much um, trying to think about how I train my students to get to where they want to go to after the end of the PhD. And it's a bit like what I do also with my master's students. With my master's students, I, I try and always have a conversation in the last year where I think about, well, where do they want to go or what they need to go to get there? And I think it's the same in the PhD. It's about thinking, well, what do you want to do at the end of the PhD? Um, what are the advantages if you say you'd like to go for an academic career? How best can you get there? What do you, what do you need to do? And what can I do as an academic supervisor to help you to get there? But also recognizing that there will be many others uh, who will have done a PhD, uh, but will not have at the end goal um, uh, wanting to, to become an academic. And I think that that's where as a, we have to remember that the PhD degree is not a research, it's not a research project that's meant to lead to um, very distinct research outcomes, uh, papers, etc. cetera, in, in, in itself. I mean, it, it can do because that's actually quite a good way to get somebody on the route to an academic career, but, but not necessarily. And so that notion of, of, of the, the, the training and the wider support that a student needs during their PhD, I think is actually very important. It's not just preparing people to get academic jobs. If it is, there aren't enough jobs and we'd have to cut back the number of PhD students very radically. Thank you. So I think we have addressed this topic quite a lot in the past minutes. Um, I'd like to launch um, a new topic that I don't know if it has been uh, mentioned in the questions already, but that is work-life balance. Um, so is family friendliness fair to childless researchers? Is working over hours fair to researchers having persons to care of? Perhaps we should all just work no more than eight hours a day. Um, who would like to give an answer to that? Oh, yeah. go ahead, oh, yeah. Valeria. You go. Okay, <laughs> no problem. Uh, well, um, very, very good question. Um, I'm, I sometimes find myself. So I'm, 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 I'm I don't have children. Uh, I don't have a family to take care of for the moment. But I all, all, often wonder, like. So since I'm in this condition, so I, am I supposed or am I expected to just be available anytime, any day? And sometimes I have the feeling that the answer is yes. Um, and then it's not just my feeling. I've been debating this with other uh, friends and colleagues in the same condition. And um, it's it's a little bit of, yeah. And it's uh, so my time since I'm not, caring for just I mean I'm caring just for myself then less valuable I think is not and uh, as far as I, I I know and I do it I, I do work over hours at times but I, I'm really wishing that we can pass the message that that should not be the rule I don't like the idea that as, as I work as a scientist then I, I it's okay if I work 12 hours a day uh, or every weekend uh, there might be times that that is requested and needed uh, because of field work, for example, and, I mean, and if I'm in a field, uh, and if, if it's a weekend, I don't still I don't have to, to do my field work, or or like maybe some experiments that take longer than, than needed. But um, I I really hope that and and I yeah that the the, the 
time, like work-life balance is very important. And sometimes I feel like we are, uh, as in general, we are expected to, 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 to work too much, too many hours. And then that I would say also is disruptive in terms of uh, production and quality and, and, and so on. So I, it's something that we should really be careful about. And I hope um, I, I, I never had supervisors that were asking me to, to overdo. So, and, uh, but I, and I, I hope that, and I, I have the feeling that the, the so uh, Stuart, Duarte and Whitney are, are all very, I, I really like what you're saying. So I, I, I think your students are very lucky to have your supervisors. Uh, so I think it should really go into that, that direction. Thank you. Duarte has a raised hand. I think Whitney was before me. Okay, you're right. Um, I, yeah, I agree with Valeria and I guess I, I would just say I'm not sure the concept of fairness is a, is a great way to look at this problem. I think it's become clear we've, we should move away from the perception of an ideal or correct academic path and, and move towards greater flexibility. And it's kind of like I mentioned that before the EOS article on the Braided River and we should think of, you know, branches of our lives and careers and other creative interests that weave in and out um, from each other. And, I think this could actually benefit science um, because of you know our own as scientists diversity of pursuit and the act of doing other things may influence our creativity or our productivity. Um, but I will add though that for many of us, I, I do have a child and I do try to maintain a work-life balance. I'm probably terrible at it, but I know that that many of us science is really a pursuit of passion, which means that even if the academic world were designed to facilitate a better work-life balance, some of us might actually struggle to take advantage of that. Um, a lot of us, you know, we, we do get really engaged in our work and sometimes lose perspective on what, what is more important around us. And I mean, I think sometimes historically this really hard pursuit of a problem is what actually has led to many scientific break breakthroughs um, in the past as people kind of sitting in their basement doing experiments or you know, playing with radiogenic materials. And, you know, so I think, um, I think there's, there, we just need a flexibility. Yeah, just to, to issue, issue this, the flexibility is the important thing. But uh, again, my experience shows that often this seniority, this power of flexibility increases. Um, so in, again, in my experience, I was a full professor before I came uh, pregnant and, First, I was astonished how many of my colleagues assumed some kind of major plan in doing this, which was, of course, ridiculous. I mean, you can't plan uh, these things. Uh, but that there was just this basic assumption of oh, brilliant. Now she is a full professor. Now she can go ahead and start her family. So that's the first thing I experienced, which I found outrageous. But secondly, uh, again, this was at the university in the UK, where our then principal started breakfast meetings um, um, eight o'clock. And again, I was the only one, the only faculty member who reminded him that actually the university nursery didn't open until 8.30. So I was then offered personal meetings, but of course what I missed in these personal meetings with the principal, it's all these important decisions and discussions which are going on. So there is something fundamentally wrong and at the end, I declined, of course, uh, to go to these breakfast meetings, but I could do so because I had a tenured full professorship position. I would have not dared to do this on a lectureship position, you know, to cancel my principal of the university. And I think that's, that's, that's the, the fundamental problem is uh, the flexibility which is needed and the flexibility solves so many problems but we don't have the flexibility until we reach a certain seniority. And I think that's, that's still a major problem. Yeah, yeah, I guess we all kind of have to play by the rules of the game as long as we are non-tenured, <laughs> seems like. Uh, on, on this note, there's a question from the Q&A that has been suggested by one of my co-conveners. Uh, do you think that early career scientists should take a different approach to slow versus fast science in comparison to tenured professors along these lines? Stuart. I think it, it, this, 
the, the response to this question um, touches um, people in, in different ways. Um, I think that the more senior scientists who have tenure who are established have some responsibility to make sure that the system, I don't think you'll ever have a fair system, but at least is as fair as it can be. And it kind of touches a little bit on the on the on the last question that that whilst on on the one hand I think one of the things I like about uh, being an academic is the liberty to uh, work the extra hours if I so wish. We also have to trade that off against those who have caring responsibilities or other limits on the extent to which they can actually take on that liberty. Now, if we have a system that does not recognise those constraints on what people can do in terms of their time then we run the risk of perpetuating inequalities even more so than they are now. So that is where I think the responsibilities for, 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 for slow science actually in, 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 in people who, who have uh, uh, more senior roles are actually really very serious. They have to think about what, what uh, life is like um, for uh, more junior staff and not forget it because many of them will have been through it, through it themselves. But on the other hand, I think that um, where, where, where I, 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 I suppose I, I worry a little bit is the system for more junior staff, um, because uh, whilst there are clearly um, university systems, uh, research councils that are moving more towards policies that, that, that aren't formally slow science policies, but they align with them, adoption of DORA being one thing, not everyone does. And as I said earlier, even when you have these policies, they aren't necessarily applied. So that carries a risk um, for uh, more, more, more junior staff. If you're in a system that, that might have laudable goals, but where those goals aren't necessarily being, being followed or adopted. And so it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Uh, and I wish that there was a, a simple answer, a, a answer to, the, the, to, to that. I think that it, 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 it it really does come back to, um, if you like, what I see as the problem, which is people like me are not actually um, uh, uh, junior researchers. We have to set a better framework. Um, and it'd be very interesting if you can analyze today who came to this, this chat uh, or to this, uh, this debate uh, and think about how many people who actually would it might be quite nice if they could think about slow science actually came this morning to listen to it. Um, I think those are the sorts of difficult issues that we have. Yeah. Thank you very much, Stuart, for this. Um, so we have about 17 minutes left. Um, and it would be cool, and Stuart just mentioned, we have to put a better framework, we have to make a better framework for this system. And um, so perhaps it's, it's the time to think about what can realistically be done in the future. And we have a sharp question to all of you. Uh, that is, um, if you could make a new rule to change the system, what would that be? One rule, who would like to start with that? Valeria. Longer fixed terms contracts really de disbandle, dismantle the less than one year contract for sure. There should not exist for me. That would be one. Okay, thank you. I would say something that some places already do, but is to abolish the use of publication numbers and H index and search committees and instead read individual papers. Thank you. Yes, Stuart. Um, do away with publication lists. Do away with ORCID numbers that allow people to find publication lists uh, easily. Uh, do away with uh, being allowed to put Google Scholar uh, links into CVs and simply ask people to nominate five outputs that may be publications, there may be other things. Uh, in all assessment competitions. That might be slightly lower for more junior people, but certainly not going above five in any competition at all. Thank you, Stuart. Dörte? I, I have nothing left. Uh, the major rules, I think, were, were mentioned. I, I, I would probably pick 
the, the, the first one, the permanent contract is just, um, this has to change in so many con con uh, countries that institution just offer uh, uh, permanent contracts. If someone wants to retire at an institution or not, can, should be their decision and not uh, this. As I think that's the most important one. Thank you very much. Okay, these were very sharp questions. I was thinking a harsh debate would start among them, but that's not the case. So we have quite some time left for Q&A top on the list. Uh, do my co-conveners have some questions ready? Otherwise, I'm going to read them right from the top. No, that's okay, but maybe let's just take one or two more minutes maybe to, to dive into these, these four suggested changes, right? These one change wish. suggestions. Um, so how would you judge the chances or the, the, the pace that these changes could be implemented? I mean, longer contracts is definitely one, right? And the other one would be um, the publication part. Um, how, how long do you think this will take? Months, years, decades? And who should be the, the driving agents for that, right? Or in other words, if there is hope, how long should we wait for that? And who should get active now? Um, Valeria, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I would say it will be a process that had to be taken um, lead from the institutions themselves and defending agency probably because because they go together. I, I understand that universities don't have, the, don't have fundings for everybody. So we need external funding agency, but if if there were a little bit more uh, a discussion or like yeah, even a conversation among these terms, and and for example, I know that uh, LMU has, has a nice policy that at least they they abolished any contract less than six months. Still, six month contracts are possible. <laughs> so, the, the, yeah, definitely, it's that's something that has to start from institutions and then cover like. The, Possibly pyramid from top to bottom, I would say. Are there any other takes on this question by Micha? Um, I, I would say, I guess the short term contract issue is, is a harder one because it has a strong financial influence. Um, and, you know, one of the th discussions I saw, I can't remember if it was Twitter or Facebook, one of the social media sites that I follow, brought up that a lot of these short term contracts are associated with startups of new faculty. And so, you know, like they won't provide an entire postdoc, but they'll provide six months of a postdoc with the hope that the new faculty will also provide six months. And, you know, and so a lot of times it's kind of a, you, you may accidentally disadvantage the young researchers who, not, who are not being fully supported by their university, but partly to hire someone and then hope that they can carry on the funding. So I think that one's really quite, quite tricky. In terms of the search committees and devaluing numbers and metrics, I think it's already happening in a lot of places. I came from UT Austin where it was, I think, unfortunately, very heavy, heavily used in initial searches because we have hundreds of applicants. And then to ETH where it's, you know, it's basically not even looked at. We don't even examine the H index. We don't count the number of publications. And so I, you know, I've already seen this transition occur just in my own career, um, which I think is wonderful. And I think it's, it's not actually the young people's responsibility to advocate for this. It's mine now as someone who's seen both systems and really values the, you know, the taking the time and the extra time required by the search committee to just read people's papers. I think that's all it requires is those of us to be who are on the committees to be a little less lazy. Okay, thank you very much. So I guess we have um, one Q and A that has been highlighted to me. Uh, there is people who decide future developments in science nowadays were successful in the fast system as it is. Do you think they try to prevent a shift because they could lose their influence if they are evaluated differently? Would like to say something on this. I think I didn't understand the question correctly. So okay, yeah. The, the question is, uh, that the, the people that should now propose a change that they are, I guess, uh, 
among our panelists there will be Whitney Stewart and you uh, you have been successful in the fast science system as it was and do you think they would prevent a shift because they could you could lose the, your influence if you are evaluated differently basically people that have reason with it with this side with this is okay it's clear now <laughs> Stuart has a raised hand uh, I, I perhaps am the only person that oh but, well I, I started I think in the slow system um you know when I was a, a a PhD student we didn't really have email um and uh the the, the world wide web didn't wasn't something you used. If you wanted to go and read something, you had to get out of your office and walk across campus to the library. Um, so I think I think that the uh, it, the, the, the kind of people in in senior positions at, at the moment are probably more from that kind of um, sort of system. What I've seen, what I've seen, which I think is is more reassuring, more reassuring and more more heartening, is um, colleagues. Uh, who are biologically younger than me, um, but who are now taking on senior uh, leadership roles in universities, who are very sensitive to these issues and actually really want to see a move away from the kind of fast science that uh, has, has come about. And in that sense, I'm actually more optimistic um, that things, uh, things are going to change. Um, and of course, hopefully that will be rapidly, but as I think there's also a, a sense in the uh, early career research community that the nature of science and what science has become is a severe problem. And hopefully in 10 to 15 years, those early career researchers will be in a position to also reinforce the kinds of changes that are needed. So I'm, I'm always an optimistic person and I'm, I'm optimistic that things are changing in the right direction. Yeah, maybe maybe just quickly to add. Uh, so I would also agree. I, I didn't uh, grow up in the fast system. I also still remember to send hard copy manuscripts to journal, mm -hmm. and then getting several months later handwritten uh, comments on our manuscript. So this was anything than fast science. But I, I I agree with with Stuart. I think it's it's also the confidence we as mid career scientists and uh, early career scientists to, to, to continue to mention these issues and to say these issues. And I've seen a change, at least in the last 10 years. Again, in the past, I was often to, uh, told, uh, Dörte, don't say certain things, you know, this might affect your career uh, negatively. Never ever did I have any negative effect on my career despite these threats. And I think that's, that's maybe important that we just, um, have this confidence to 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 say our our concerns on all the different aspects we we discussed today, and I do see like Stuart, there are more and more uh, coming now uh, into the universities, into the into the different uh, institutions. Maybe at the moment still on mid-career level, but who do open their mouths and who do question the uh, existing system, and I think that's important. Thank you very much. There are a few more questions that uh, we'd like to have addressed. Um, has fast science culture necessitated your department's hiring of more adjuncts? Doesn't seem to spark into oh yeah, Stuart. I think that's a really difficult um, question to ask because there's a very big difference between countries and also between universities within those countries in the extent to which that solution is actually allowed. So in my university, uh, it's not allowed at all. Um, so there are very strict rules on, um, on uh, hire, uh, hiring people to, to do certain roles uh, and also very strong pressure from uh, some of what we call them the quantum media uh, the, uh, to, 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 to prevent us from, from doing that. Uh, and so it's, it's, it does, I think it's, it's quite a hard question to, to respond to. Okay, um, next question, or more like a, an interesting statement that maybe sparks some discussion is, I think talking about 
how science is a work of passion or how scientists are super passionate about the job often justifies working unreasonable hours and contributes to toxic cultures in academia, probably also to fast science. Do you think we should change the way we talk about our work? Well, if I can say something about that, um, I'm, I'm, I strive to say that I work as a scientist, not that I am a scientist, because I don't personally like to be labeled as something like that, that my job defines all I am because I'm not just a scientist. I think I have, ma I am many other things. Uh, but I would say that it goes back to what we say about the flexibility before. So we know that we do, that it's a little bit of, I don't say golden cage. So we know that we have the freedom at times to work as much as we want. And sometimes if like, so it could be over, overdue. Uh, uh, but I hope that, yeah, that, that, yeah, being passionate about your job, I think is a great thing. and. I, might give you the chance to work maybe it will overdue at times but you should also stand like yeah you should be careful all the time and and stand for like yeah your 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 health and and your work-life balance all the time then being passionate about your job should not be the it's justification to overdue no absolutely okay thank you um, is Micha having um, a follow-up? Oh, it's it's more like a, a wrapping up. Um, we screened the, the Q&As. At the moment, it's, what, 54 open questions still? And, and uh, looking at the time, we just have three to four minutes left. Um, feel free to browse the Q&As. Um, what we inspected in that is that there's a lot of, of questions, comments, and, and ideas regarding the, the publishing uh, realm of science, right? And for those, I mean, we simply can't touch on that now at the moment, but please feel free to look at the, the immense short course town hall meetings and other great debates during the, the next couple of days at EGU. Uh, hopefully many of us can meet back there and, and share these, these points one or more time again. Um, otherwise, I think, yeah, we, we covered uh, a lot of broad topics, right, in these Q and A's, and maybe we will continue this uh, a bit longer than now, but, but I think I just give it back to Andrea, right? Um, a lot of has been, been covered, publishing is, is a, an overarching hot topic just as an essence of the q a box at the moment that's all from my side okay then i would have another question that has been highlighted to me is um thanks a lot for a very interesting and helpful talk thank you for joining me concerning the career in academia how significant is the impact of the journal for publication Open access journals typically have a lower impact factor, but more people can read the paper. So what would you recommend? Since there was some problem connecting at the meeting, I'm sure I'm not sure if this question has already been answered. Many thanks. So we haven't really. Whitney? So I'm a big fan of, of open access journals, and I'm really excited about the new ones that are developing, at least in my own field, that are actually being fueled by young researchers kind of from the bottom up and they're designing it from scratch. And I just think it's an amazing movement that is really exciting to me. And I think it's along the lines of, you know, some of the other metrics that the impact factors are not really that meaningful. A lot of the high impact factors associated with certain high impact journals that I won't mention are associated with their front matter and other things that they that they post and also they have a heavy bias toward publishing positive results rather than negative ones. In other words, things that um, are failed experiments, for example, and these open access journals, I think have less of that pressure and therefore have the potential to increase uh, the quality of what we publish and we should just ignore their impact, fact impact factor uh, values. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's about time to wrap this debate up. Um, I would like to mention again that this is not a one time uh, event and um, we'd like to repeat these sort of sessions perhaps in the following EGUs and since we see that it has been very well attended, it might be worth it to create an environment where people can interact, discuss and maybe produce some proposals in, in, in such meetings uh, throughout breakout, not breakout rooms in, the terms, in, in terms of virtual ones but round tables and so on um i i have to apologize with my co conveners not for uh, introducing them at the beginning i forgot that but uh, you have had the occasion to listen and look at them throughout the debate and 
thank I would like to thank all the speakers for their time and involvement, both leading up to the debate and during the debate today. And if nothing, no one else has something to add, I think we might give back the control to Chloe. I would like to say something. Thank you also to all the people that published or, or published uh, who wrote uh, in the chat all the questions. We are going to um, look at them in detail and, uh, of course, classify and see where the main issues are and going to use them for hopefully future events like this. So thank you very much for contributing in the chat so much as well.